Yeah, the microphone is still working. We had a nice long break. I didn't realize how one hour elapsed. I had budgeted a longer break and somehow it went very fast. I talked to a lot of people about many interesting things. And here we are ready to start another afternoon session with Ryan Kelly. And I'm going to cede the microphone to look for it to introduce Ryan. Thank you very much. Uh, we're excited to hear about Ryan's new uh, advances in the um, research to share with us, but just to give him a quick intro, he's a good friend of the conference, good friend of the community, and uh, he and his team have long developed and disseminated uh, and uh, made advances in uh, separations and, and uh, sensitivity for single cell and low, put, low input samples for proteomic analysis, and we're really excited to see uh, what he has to share with us today. Thank you very much. Let's make sure things are working. So, so yeah, I'm kind of organizing uh, this talk around uh, improvements in sensitivity first, then we'll talk about throughput and accessibility. And so I, I love the panel earlier. And also, thank you, Nikolai, for continuing uh, and team for continuing to organize such a great meeting. It's just uh, been awesome to see it grow over the years. Um, so yeah, so I'm gonna start, and, and this is, uh, you know, we, we like a good variety of biology and technology here, right? This is technology, this one, this this talk, just. <laughs> um, so um, so first of all, why, why do we care about uh, increasing um, sensitivity and, and proteome coverage? I think for cell typing, you don't necessarily need to go very deep into the proteome. Those abundant proteins um, have different abundances from cell to cell, right? And so, so for just cell typing, uh, identifying different cells, you don't necessarily need to go very deep. But to look at different classes of proteins, and I've been you know, using this slide for, for quite some time, um, going from, uh, uh, I guess this way, right? Um, lower intense, uh, lower abundance proteins are different classes of proteins. And you simply can't study what's going on with those proteins uh, if you're limited to a method that, that can only identify the top several hundred, right? So, so that's kind of the, one of the driving forces for, for going deep. And we can look over time at um, how the, the field has evolved, right? So, so with mass cytometry and facts and immunofluorescence, you're, you're looking at about tens of proteins per cell at, at maximum, right? And in uh, you know, five or six or seven years ago, uh, Scope MS came along, and uh, Team Slavov and Budnik, and then uh, Team Zhu and Kelly developed uh, nanopots. Uh, these are complementary approaches for um, for looking at uh, single cells. And these initial embodiments, we're looking at hundreds of proteins per cell, right? And then there's been a lot of work in the intervening years. There's been analytical improvements uh, in terms of liquid and gas phase separations, mass spectrometry instrumentation, and um, you know I, I know what's coming from from our, our main instrument vendors at ASMS, and I'm like, oh man, I. Uh, Need to need to shake the money trees again because they. I, I feel like this year it's kind of a a step step change in, in what's coming, uh, and there have been uh, improvements in uh, mass spectrometry acquisition. So you can see tens to hundreds to thousands. So we're all relying on Neil to get us to millions of proteoforms per cell, right? So um, so. Um, so what we've been working on to improve uh, sensitivity, one of those things is, is low flow separations, right? And this is a, uh, from a direct infusion experiment that, that Suchi in my group did, just going from one microliter per minute down to one nanoliter per minute. And there are different, different uh, diameter emitters that work in different flow re regimes here. But you can see in general, as we go from 
typical few hundred nanoliters per minute down to 20 nanoliters per minute around here, we get about a 10x increase in uh, mass spectrometer signal per analyte molecule. So, so uh, it's one way to, to make a, a brighter ion source. And so, so all of our work from the early kind of nanopots days, um, we've uh, gone from 75 micron columns and all of our single cell work has been with kind of 30 micron ID columns and below. So, so reducing the bore of your column allows you to operate at a the same linear velocity, but at a lower volumetric flow rate uh, to, to get the ionization benefits. And so it's not um, exactly, uh, the other thing is that going from here to here, this is a, a game of diminishing returns, right? You can, you can go to a lot of pain to work at 10 nanoliters per minute to maybe double the proteum coverage that you get. So, um, so this is uh, some more recent separations, a 20 minute active elution window um, without any match between runs uh, and just with a Orbitrap Explorus 480, about 6,500 peptides and 1,500 proteins. The, the, um, so this is with a 20 micron inner diameter column. Uh, packed by our, our LC guru T in the group. Um, and um, so, so that's one of the things that we do is just working with low flow separations to enhance sensitivity. See, the other thing is on the kind of acquisition front, uh, we realized that for um, with Orbitrap based instrumentation, you need longer injection times to have an adequate ion population for an MS2 spectrum. Uh, so that means that you're collecting fewer MS2 spectra, but it also gives you an opportunity to, you might as well run the uh, Orbitrap in a higher resolution mode if you're going slow anyway. And so that gives you the opportunity to resolve multiple peptides in one MS2 spectrum for label-free analyses. And uh, right at this time, uh, Thermo partnered up with MS Aid and uh, developed the Chimera search engine that is really built to uh, identify multiple proteins or uh, fragment ions from multiple precursors in a single MS2 spectrum. So you can think of this wide window acquisition as doing data dependent acquisition with data independent acquisition sized isolation windows, right? And, um, and I think the reason that in our hands, it's worked a little bit better than, than a straight up DIA, because since you're focused, you're centered on one ion, that, that you're likely to detect, you at least get one identification per MS2 spectrum. And then if there are other low-lying precursors around that, you get those two. So um, uh, where if you're kind of blindly scanning through, I think a lot of those spectra are not productive. So this is what it looks like scanning from, uh, this is a wide window going from uh, short injection time and a relatively low resolution uh, spectrum to higher, longer injection times, higher resolution, longer injection times, higher resolution. You can see we're, we're collecting fewer MS2 spectra here, but our PSMs actually maximize in the middle somewhere. Um, and then this is just saying how, how wide do we open those windows? Um, uh, two Thompson is close to a standard data dependent acquisition. And then we go wider and wider. And when we look at our unique peptides, uh, we get about a 30% increase in the kind of eight to 18 Thompson range. And so either this resolution or this resolution tends to work pretty well. So what this does for single cell analysis, and mind you, this is with the Orbitrap Explorus uh, mass spectrometer. We're getting over uh, with a 12 Thompson isolation window, 40 minute elution. We're getting over 2000 proteins. This is for 0 0.2 
nanogram HeLa digest that's being analyzed. Uh, without match between runs, about 2,100, and with match between runs, 3,600. And when we uh, cut our separation time in half from 40 minutes to 20 minutes, we only lose, you know, around 10% of our proteome coverage. So that's a, that's a worthwhile trade-off for many, many applications. Um, and this is just looking at kind of PCA plots of two different cell types and two different separation times here, um, showing that, we, you know, we get get nice clustering. None of this was with actual single cells. When we do switch to single cells and compare uh, wide window with standard data dependent acquisition with DIA, uh, you can see uh, we're getting kind of the best proteome coverage here. Um, it's not much difference between DDA and wide window. Um, except that you'll notice we get a lot more MS2-based identifications with the wide window acquisition. And those are more confident than what we get with the match between runs. So again, uh, useful, I think. Um, and then uh, I can differentiate cells. This is pretty cool. This is what, something that Sam and uh, Hannah, who who is here, uh, worked out. They, they basically uh, made a histogram based on Jesper Olson, uh, a data set from deep fractionation, large sample amounts of, of HeLa digest, where they looked at, um, here's your number of proteins versus uh, your copy number. So going from 100 million to a million uh, on down. And this is what they see. And we, plotting our previous kind of most sensitive workflow uh, from 2021. This is this is what we were able to see. Um, and, and then this wide window acquisition really drops us another order of magnitude into um, into in terms of lower copy numbers per per cell. Uh, and if we look at different uh, molecular functions and biological processes, point four is saying, we're identifying 40% uh, of the proteins related to cell division in that bulk study, and then uh, relative to what we were previously able to identify. So a nice advance. Uh, one recent addition here is doing a, a single gene knockout. This is a, a, a protein involved in autophagy. Uh, again, similar proteome coverage, about 3,000 or so proteins per cell. And even just knocking out one gene, we can still differentiate. Uh, control versus knockout, and see, I, I don't show it here, but you can see a lot of um, proteins involved in that autophagy pathway that are significantly differentially um, regulated just by knocking out that one gene. So so that's kind of the, the story of uh, what we've been working on with sensitivity. Now accessibility is, is something else that we are really... Um, working hard on. And so um, the nanopots workflow and a lot of uh, single cell proteomics workflows now are one pot, right? We're not transferring the sample from vessel to vessel and doing a bunch of cleanup because we know that we're going to lose some of our proteome every time every time we do this. So so now we're going not only one pot, but one step, okay? So this is some work that Maddie is doing in the lab. And so um, what we realized basically is that um, for our first step has always been um, heating up our our sample in the presence of a non-ionic surfactant, dodecylmaltoside DDM, for one hour at 70 C. Okay, and and then we came across this rapid trypsin or rapid trypsin slash lyse C uh, mixture from Promega that is stabilized to work well at high temperatures. They say you should incubate for one hour at 70 degrees C, okay? So we we just are basically omitting reduction. You don't have to re omit reduction, but it uh, doesn't do good things. I'm sure we're reducing trypsin and lyse C. Um, so, um, so we looked at four different formulations, uh, the protease, plus reducing agent, protease plus uh, um, the surfactant plus reducing agent, protease only and protease plus DDM. It's interesting that um, 
the protease alone without the DDM does looks like it's doing almost as well. Um, and uh, anyway, so so that has worked really well. When we compare it back to our multi-step nanopots workflow, uh, no no significant difference in in uh, proteome coverage, and uh, you know these agree fairly well. Uh, have similar hydrophobicities observed in, in the peptides. And then the other thing uh, Maddie's done is look at the, um, going from our standard glass substrates to a polypropylene substrate that, that Ying had injected injection molded uh, when he was still at PNNL. And so comparing these two substrates and um, so, so essentially nanopots is just reducing the, the contact area, um, but the nature of that contact area also matters. So we get a little boost by switching from glass to polypropylene there. Um, the trade-off is that you can't uh, image your sample very well in this, this translucent polypropylene where, where the glass nanopods chips are really good for imaging. Um, and so uh, picking up on this, Jimena in the group, uh, we've been uh, partnering with uh, with HP uh, with their D100 single cell dispenser and saying, well, you know, the bottom of a well plate is not much different. These are PCR plates. They're nice. They taper to a nice small area at the bottom. So we said, well, let's just take this cell dispenser and we can uh, dispense a single cell into each of these and then use the, the dispenser to also dispense reagents into those. And so it's just really quickly fills up a well plate and um, tells you which ones successfully had a, a cell transferred uh, and which ones are like, don't use this, it either missed or has multiple cells in it. Um, and then the rapid trypsin, an hour later, we're ready to ready to run, right? So this is just um, characterizing the the reagent dispensing reproducibility. So what we're doing is we're changing the volume, but we're proportionally changing the concentration across the 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 dispensed volume range. So we want to see the same signal, and we do, and we see which which makes sense. Um, these are they're just counting droplets, right? So um, so anyway, really good uh, dispensing performance. Uh, we looked at going from two hundred nanoliters. Uh, one nanogram of trypsin up to 500 nanoliters. And we said, well, should we keep the same amount of trypsin or should we keep the same concentration of trypsin? So we looked at that. It looks like the keeping the same one nanogram works and there's really no um, great uh, detriment to increasing the volume a little bit there. Um, and we can look at different cell types and Fortunately, we we this makes sense, right? HeLa is bigger than Jercat cells. Um, one thing that was weird to us here was this is Jercat; it all clusters nicely, but we saw within our HeLa uh, a big difference. Uh, you know, two distinct clusters in a PCA plot uh, for HeLa, and so that was kind of weird, uh, but. Uh, we did some fax sorting of the same population, and and the the fax. Uh, technician was like, oh yeah, you do have two cell populations. So that may make sense. And so these, these are bigger, these are smaller, um, about 22, 2300 proteins on average here versus about 1700 proteins on average there. So anyway, we don't really know. This is all very preliminary, um, but, uh, but I think it's nice in terms of accessibility. This is a pretty low cost uh, dispenser and well plates. So, so, you know, getting away, um, a, a, for, for certain applications, maybe not having to worry about, uh, expensive custom, uh, substrates is a nice thing. Okay. So, so we've talked about sensitivity. We talked about accessibility now a little bit on, uh, throughput. So this, uh, uh, this is not a project that you could do with the HP cell dispenser. This, this really relied heavily on the cell in one because this is just a tiny, uh, this is a nested nano well. 
uh, building on some work from Ying Zhu at, at PNNL, now at Genentech. And it's only two or three millimeters in diameter in each one of these inside wells is uh, is just a couple hundred micrometers. You can see what a great job the cell in one does of accurately placing a cell inside each of these wells. They're even kind of in the same part of the well uh, across that. So, um, so the way we leverage that cell dispensing um, reproducibility is, is to um, take the scope MS combined with uh, SILAC, right? And so, so, um, so we can have our heavy or light cells grown on different, different media. And then, um, TMT, uh, apply a TMT plex to both of those. And so, um, each of those can give us, uh, MS2s. Unfortunately, this is without any carrier channel. Our proteome coverage is pretty low, right? Four or five hundred proteins per cell. Um, it's just not what we're used to seeing with with label free. And even with a ten nanogram carrier, we can get to you know uh, about eight or nine hundred per cell with um, with a, a sixty minute gradient or with a ninety minute gradient around a thousand per cell. So uh, the proteome coverage is not great, and and um, this is something that that others have noticed as well and and just i think requires a little bit of additional optimization but you know four different cell types we were able to tease those apart um and um i think there are two issues with this one is uh the the current software the built-in software to make sure that if you pick one uh one precursor you also grab the heavy version uh, you know, grabbing those in pairs is not working well. And I think Chris Rose is developing a better algorithm uh, for that. And then uh, just the the slow speed of MS2 is a trade-off, right? Because we're, we now have twice the number of precursors to choose from. Um, but I think that's a, that's an issue that's going to be solved with the next generation of instrumentation. Another uh, way we're looking at improving throughput um, for these low flow separations, or at least to, to show the problem we currently run into, um, is that, you know, active peptide elution is just one portion of the overall LC cycle, right? We need to regenerate the column. There may be a gradient delay. Then we actively pe elute peptides. And then we need to wash these hydrophobic species out like DDM, for example. Um, and so this can cause a, a challenge in terms of throughput. Uh, and so what Xiaofeng has done is uh, develop a multi-column nano LC platform that allows us to um, store a sample in inside a storage loop. So the sample plus the gradient behind it hang out in this storage loop. And we can just use an isocratic pump to elute this uh, through, push the sample plus the gradient through the column. Um, and so it's similar to what um, EvoCEP does, right? Uh, it's just kind of a multiplexed uh, version of that. So, so while we're eluding peptides on this column, we're regenerating this column and we're using a binary pump at low pressure to push a sample into the storage loop. So all of this is happening at the same time. And while all that's going on, we can be auto sampling a third sample. So, so it allows us to these these steps that are often serial, we can do them all at the same time, and then just say, alternate which which column is is spraying. This this requires us to um, generate the gradient faster than we use the gradient. But this shows you know we we see no no difference in peak width. The the elution profiles look very similar. The proteome coverage looks very similar. Whether we go fast, uh, generate the gradient fast or or slow. Um, and it also allows us to be very selective about what goes to the column, the analytical column, versus what we spit out to waste. Okay, and so this is where we let everything go to the analytical column, the hydrophilic species, 
uh, the more hydrophobic peptides and the wash at the end. We let that all go through, but we can also tune it so only the, the, the stuff we want to measure goes to the column and we protect the column. It never sees those hydrophobic species and it never sees the salts or anything like that at the beginning. Or we can be more selective and say, I just care about something in this, in this late eluding portion and I'm just going to prevent any of that to, from, from coming into the, the column. So, so we're going from one column to a different column, alternating, or we can do three or four plex as, as needed, uh, depending on the, the duty cycle of a single column here. Um, and so it's nice to see that they roughly um, overlap. The coverage roughly is similar as we run replicate uh, measurements. And um, this is like 30 minutes gradient single cell analysis. And I should say, as, as we were kind of developing this, it was done with 60 minute gradients originally, and it was just working so well. We were running, uh, so everybody that had any, any samples in the queue was like, before you take this away or change anything, I need to run my samples. And so we ended up running six or 800 LCMS runs with the same columns here because we're able to really protect them from, from you know, they just see the good stuff. Um, and so that's, that's really good. Now we need to make it faster, right? And so we, sadly, we had to sacrifice this really nicely working platform uh, for a while. Where we want to go is we want to have separations that are fast, have a high peak capacity, a low flow, and a 100% duty cycle. And this separation that T uh, has been working on, this basically gets three of the four, right? We haven't multiplexed this yet, but within four or five minutes, this is this is a separation that typically looks, you know, takes an hour uh, to, to have this peak capacity. We're getting it in less than five minutes. And um, anyway, and, and we're still keeping it at 20 nanoliters per minute. So this is kind of the thing that we're going to be um, putting on the multi-column system next. Another, aspect of throughput is the data analysis, right? If we're generating a proteome every five minutes or every couple of minutes, if it's a, if we're multiplexing on top of that, that is just a huge amount of data that, that we have to deal with. And that can become the bottleneck. We can generate faster than we can analyze at some point. So um, Xiao Feng, same guy that was doing this multi-column stuff, he was like, you know, the way you guys are analyzing your data in this group is really stupid. So, so he, he said, oh, I, I, you know, I thought I was hiring an analytical chemist, but he is like, no, I'm just gonna make it so as soon as that run comes off the, the mass spec, it gets automatically searched, it gets, um, it gets uh, automatically processed. And so I'm just gonna make, take all the human stuff out from data generated to data analyzed. And so this has been really awesome for our group and it's made to be kind of a collaborative project. It's open source, uh, it's already on GitHub and Xiaofeng will have a poster on this at, at ASMS. So I hope you're interested because it can basically be trained to do anything. Uh, any search engine, Proteum Discoverer, MaxQuant, FragPipe, any search engine that can be accessed by command line can, can work really well with this. And so um, we can send it to multiple. So we can, first of all, automatically handle our data storage, right? Data management. We can say, okay, delete this right away or keep this um, and, and send our, our data to multiple on, on site and off site locations. Um, and then, um, uh, he calls these workers. So maybe different computers that are doing the heavy lifting uh, of running the, uh, the, the search. Um, they can all be working in parallel and just taking the queue and, and chomping through it. All right. And, and then this is kind of what our, our interface here, great for a PI because I can just 
from here, you know, log in, say, oh, okay, what, what are we running right now? Click on one of these or search based on the, the, the person running the experiment or anything like that. And these, since these are automatically searched, just pull it up, see, see how the runs are looking. Um, this is if we were to click on one of these, um, we can look at the chromatogram, we can look at the injection time, anything we want here. Um, can can uh, be done. So so anyway, I'll just wrap up. Uh, hopefully, I've shown some advances in sample prep, separations, mass spec acquisition, and a little bit of data analysis. Um, I think things are becoming increasingly robust, quantitative, easy to perform. Uh, the hyperplexing was giving us a throughput of about 300 cells per day. That was with a really, really low duty cycle LC separation. So um, if we were to multiplex that separation, that would be 700 cells per day uh, with that approach. Still needs a little bit of baking, I think, to be fully practical. And then the wide window acquisition with the Explorer S480 is giving us a proteome uh, coverage of more than 3,000 cells per day. Uh, with that, I want to thank the thank the really great research group that we have going at at BYU. Uh, Xiao Feng did the uh, both the Xiao Feng did the um, the multi column LC work and that data we're calling that MS Connect that that data uh, management software. T is our wizard with um, the the separations, and he did the wide window experiments. And uh, Maddie did um, that one step prep, and Jimena has been working with that HP dispenser. And uh, just uh, and thank you to Nikolai for showing this in, in between sessions. Just wanted to make sure everybody's aware the party is continuing in October in Utah. It will just be in Utah one time because I really now appreciate what goes into organizing a conference. And uh, so uh, it will just be in Utah one time, but we're hoping to kind of rotate this one around. If we think about this meeting as multiple uh, technologies focused on the single cell proteome. This is mass spectrometry, um, but looking at all ohms, right? And uh, so anyway, hope you can join us there. And with that, happy to uh, answer any questions you may have. Thank you so much for a great talk. It's a, a theme, I think, at this conference that I've now seen over the last few years that throughput and sensitivity are always uh, a name to improve. And so it's really cool to see what you and your lab and the team are doing for it. Thank you. Yeah, it's it's bottomless, right? We always want to go deeper and we always want to go faster. So ne we're never going to say, oh, that's that's enough, right? Until we match RNA-seq, right? And then we'll, <laughs> so. So uh, I'll just open it up to any questions from the audience right now. Thank you again. Uh, wonderful talk. Uh, Thank you. So, um, in the slide where you show is 20 nanolithal flow rate that you have, uh, you didn't reach 100% duty cycle. Um, I'm, I'm a little curious. So, what exactly is stopping you from uh, accelerating the flow rate at the very beginning? You don't have any peptide there. You don't need uh, low flow rate to maintain sensitivity. You just don't have anything there. Just accelerate it and then make sure that when peptide solute, you have 20 nanolithal hanging out of the needle. Yeah, so um, so why not just accelerate where you want, where, where, when nothing of interest is eluding, and then drop your flow for your analysis? Is that what you're sort of saying? Yes. Yeah, so the Vanquish Neo, Thermo's newest LC system, essentially does that, right? Uh, it, it has a, a high pressure limit of up to 1500 bar. And so, so you can really go fast through the regeneration and washing steps and then slow it down for the elution, right? But pressure is kind of the currency of liquid phase, of, of liquid chromatography. If I have 1500 bar, I wanna be doing my separation at 1500 bar because I'll get narrower peaks, right? Uh, I, I can have a longer column, narrower peaks, and and um, and uh, at really high peak capacity separation. So so you're essentially if you're running your separation at a low pressure, 
you're leaving some separation performance on the table is my my opinion so um so we're running the whole thing at the highest pressure our system can handle so so there's no more room to go up in, oh, in that bottleneck, I see. yeah yeah it, we're, we're already kind of uh as, as high as our we feel our fittings and and uh pump can can handle without a lot of headache there so but that's exactly you should you should work with for thermo because that's what they do <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah uh, thank you for presentation um, I'm guessing that you do not see it in cleanup before injection. So is there any problem without cleanup to inject very low ID column? So can you routinely use your column for like one month, two months like that? Yeah, so we always have a, a trap column uh, on our system so that that trap column or solid phase extraction column is over here we always have that and um the reason we do you actually lose some of your sample this way versus a direct loading but if we're working at 20 nanoliters per minute and we have a one microliter sample loop or something like that it just takes too long to um so, you know, that's 50 minutes, I think, uh, to uh, transfer our sample from a direct sample loop into uh, in, onto the column. And so so it's not for sensitivity that we that we do this um, primarily. It's for time saving because because this uh, we can we can run this at a very high flow rate because the only real back source of back pressure is that trap column itself and and we can run straight to waste and and it works fine um it's um but on the other hand we do if we have to do it anyway we take advantage and use it for cleaning up our sample at the same time right so but it does serve both both purposes some cleanup selective elution to the analytical column but also it's a time saver so uh, and we've seen I, I can't remember which group maybe the, maybe carl meckler's group was showing uh without trapping and with trapping they actually get better proteome coverage without a trap column because you know you don't recover everything there can you comment a little bit about the missingness with the wide uh, window DDA isolations? Yeah, so so I don't know. I, I don't have an exact, um, uh, you know, metrics on the top of my head for that, but it's it's lower, right? Because because the it's not it's also not a smart method, right? It's just doing DDA and saying what else do I happen to gather with with a wide window there rather than a 1.6 or 0.7 dalton window um and so it's it's not smart but you are we we have a huge number of psms with that method i i can't remember how many but a lot of of psms if we zip back here um yeah so so thirty thousand. PSMs or 20, 28,000 PSMs, but they're redundant, right? Uh, some of those are redundant. So that's why we only get about 10,000 peptides with um, MS2 alone. And then with match between runs, we had 20,000 peptides per cell, but it's that redundancy um, that, uh, you know, it limits our coverage. We don't identify 28,000 peptides, but what it does help with is reducing missing values because because we get multiple we're identifying the same peptide multiple times. Ryan, when you when you do the hyperplexing you increase the number of precursors and that has the potential of increasing co-isolation, but it may not increase it depending on how narrow the isolation windows are and how good the separation is. So 
I wonder if you have looked into that uh, in your data, whether there is any increased isolation in hyperflexin. Yeah, I don't know that we have. So, so it's it's published, right? It's in analytical chemistry, but um, it was with a student that was leaving, so it, we kind of took what we had. And there is more to do there, right? Improved, um, uh, you know, because there's there's a clear trade off, right? We're we're identifying um, more more cells per unit, you know, the proteins in more cells per unit time, but not necessarily more spectra, right? And so there's more work to do, um, some faster um, mass spectrometers that may or may not be released uh, at, at ASMS should, should help that approach a lot. And then the improved pair picking uh, algorithm should, should help that a lot. Um, in terms of co-isolation, yeah, we just, uh, maybe I'm not thinking on my feet very well, but, um, you know, it would definitely be something good to look at experimentally. Okay. Yeah. And then I have another question, which is a little bit more open-ended. Uh, you have been at, at the leading edge of developing the low flow approaches that increase sample delivery to the instruments. And we all appreciate their benefits and your work beautifully illustrates that. But of course, there's also the pain of getting them to work. And um, what is your vision in the future? Let's say this meeting or the international single cell mass spectrometry conference two, three, five, six years down the road. Do you imagine us all talking about those methods and using them in a more painless way? Yes, I hope so. So I think part of the issue of, of um, moving to, to that is three things have to happen. You have to jump on all three at the same time, because if you have a, a great low flow column, but not a, a LC system to, you know, efficiently use your mass spectrometer, that's not good. If you have the low flow column and the LC system that go hand in hand for that, but you don't have the emitter to work well and stably at those low flow rates, it still doesn't count for anything. So all three of those have to happen at once um, to, to uh, make that go. But, you know, uh, in my experience, and, and starting at PNNL in 2005, it was all, you know, 150 micron ID columns at 1.8 microliters per minute. And it was really hard to get down to 75 micron ID columns that were working at 300 nanoliters per minute. And then it's been really hard to get down to the next one. But once you do it, it's not hard anymore, right? My For, for my group, um, the 30 is really easy. The 20 is where it's a little bit more challenging because that's that's kind of, you know, so you, so you learn a few things every every iteration you go down. And of course, we want to get to um, where's the low flow stuff? Uh, maybe it's before that. Of course, we want to get down to one nanoliter per minute, right? Look at that. So good. So, <laughs> so, um, so, uh, so even the best we're doing is, you know, in here somewhere. So, um, but is it worth that? That's a, a whole next level of pain, right? To do an injection. Okay, yeah. So, so there. yeah. Um, uh, but we didn't do an LC injection there. So that's, that's the, that's the hard part. Um, so, I mean, I think, you know, not too long ago, there were no, sub 75 micron columns commercially available. Now those are starting to show up. And so I think um, if the motivation is there um, and it's, you know, like we set it up, it's a little bit of a, a work to set up that multi-column system, but then it just runs and runs and runs and runs and runs. The only thing that uh, limits us from keeping it running forever is we don't have infinite number of LC systems. So when we want to do something new, we have to cannibalize it and use it, you know, use the parts for the next thing. And um, so, so yeah, I think it's at least what I hope this shows is that it's possible to robustly operate at really low flow rates. Uh, um, it's not easy all the time yet, but I think it can get there. Thank you. I look yeah. forward to that time when it's 
easy, easy. And yeah. accessible for Yeah, everybody. yeah. <laughs> we'll get a system up here and uh, yeah. Alexander. Oh, you're in the echo zone. Good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, great progress. Nice talk. Thank you. Uh, always uh, happy to see uh, your progress. And uh, to follow up on the technical side of things, you mentioned uh, your SPE column, one or two on your schematics. I think it was just one. And you got a question about the SPE column. And I know you're interested in developing new, new types of SPE columns. Is there anything a new specific special about that uh, SP column that you used? So, uh, a back column or monolithic column, anything like yeah, that? Yeah, so for, for this work, this has just been fritted on both ends so we can do back flush um, packed SPE columns. Um, uh, Kay Weber in my group has a, uh, he actually has an oral, I think, on Thursday afternoon at ASMS on an open tubular at SPE column um, that, or yeah, open tubular SPE that that he's working on, um, and that kind of originated because we were very frustrated with clogging our trap columns all the time. Now, as we've learned some of those tricks, that's not happening very much anymore. So. Um, and the the open tubular columns don't have quite the same performance yet. Um, so so it's it could it's a work in progress. Yeah. All right. And yeah. On one of your slides, you had a fitting of some sort. Is it something also novel? Or no, that was just a Valco a Valco fitting, just showing um, just showing sometimes the the low pressure or low flow high pressure connections can be difficult to troubleshoot that sort of thing so so just showing you know these are uh, some of these fittings at the low flow are not always trivial and so ni it's nice to have an auto sampler that once you set it up and it works well it just keeps working well right um and then and then that that system that i showed the two multi-column system almost everything is done at low pressure except for the isocratic pushing and so that that helps with there are fewer high pressure fittings in the system. So I think that's what I didn't explain it very well, but that's that was the point. Yeah. 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 All right.